This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Basketball Hall of Famer and television sportscaster Bill Walton. It's very strange how things sometimes work out. My guest today, Bill Walton, is an extremely close friend of former Grizzlies head coach Lionel Hollins, who was let go after the 2012-2013 campaign. Earlier this week, the man in charge of letting Hollins go, Grizzlies CEO Jason Levian, was shown the same door by Grizzlies majority owner Robert Para. It was startling news for the Memphis basketball community as Levian, along with Stu Lash, the likely future general manager of the team, were let go. Para immediately tabbed current GM Chris Wallace with interim responsibility for running the team's day-to-day -day basketball operations. Wallace has basically been a figurehead under Levian. In addition, COO Jason Wexler will remain responsible for the business operations. Perry, in a press release by the team, said, quote, rest assured that we remain as committed as ever to bringing a championship to this great city, end quote. Wow. Now it's all about the big redhead, the deadhead, the seven-foot hippie. Bill Walton is all of that and so much more. He's one of the greatest college basketball and pro basketball players in history, a two-time NBA champion, a former league MVP, and a three-time National Player of the Year at UCLA. Today, one of the most enlightening, interesting, and weird interviews I have ever been a part of. Like the late, great Jerry Garcia once said, what a long, strange trip it's been. The iconic Bill Walton is next on Sports Files. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Greg. Great to be here in Memphis. Great to have I you in Memphis. I didn't think that anybody liked me here. I, I, that's what I wanted to ask you. You're, you're universally adored. Around the world, that's you're adored. That's not true. The Grateful Dead wrote a song about me, St. Stephen, and the lyric that's applicable here, wherever he goes, the people all complain. <laughs> but they, they came out to see you in Memphis. Let's go back to the 73. Obviously, Big Red just controlled that game in St. Louis. Uh, you're unstoppable. What do, what do the Memphis people say to you about that? Four decades have passed and you're still a villain. They're mad as can be. But that's what makes it fun. And there's nothing like the value of sport in your individual life and in a community. And that's why I'm so glad for what Gene Bartow was able to do in his life, what Josh Pastner is doing here right now. And the driving emotions in people's lives when they get old and in the way like I am now is pride and loyalty. Pride, the satisfaction with your choices. Mm -hmm. Loyalty, do you care? And because of what the fine people here in Memphis have done with this community, with this town, with their families, with the organizations, and the people who have come out here tonight to support the Salvation Army and the sponsors and AutoZone and FedEx and Nuvasive and all the banks and all the service providers and everything, they have inspired that loyalty. So everybody cares so much about this great town. And I'm from San Diego, you know, so I don't know anything about Memphis other than it's on a big bluff on the river coming <laughs> down the hill. And Johnny Cash used to sing a lot of songs here. Right, the Grateful right. Dead have been here a lot. And I've been here with the Grateful Dead and I've been to Graceland and I've had a lot of fun here. And Lionel Hollins lives here. One of my doctors, Marcus Stewart, Marcus Stewart was here. So I've got great ties to Memphis. But I but sure liked winning that you, game. You sure did. So what's what's the greatest memory? Is it cutting down, just cutting down the net? No, we didn't cut down nets. That we was didn't not cut the deal. net down. That wasn't, that's not our So deal. what did you do to celebrate? There's nothing really like the championship celebration. Right. And I've, I've been really lucky and that I've been part of some of the great teams ever. And I had brilliant coaches, six of them who were in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I had so many wonderful teammates, uh, including one of Memphis's own right now, Lionel Hollins, who's such a... Such a remarkable spirit and force. And to know Lionel's story 
all the way back. Lionel and I, I'm a couple years older than Lionel, but we connected on the Portland Trailblazers where I played my best basketball, not very long, because uh, of all the injuries that derailed my career and right. ruined my dreams. But Lionel, as fine a man, as fine a player as I've ever known. And I just hope that one day I can become a small fraction of the human being that Lionel Holland mm. is. And it wasn't easy for Lionel. I know that when he was first in Portland, Lenny Wilkins, our great coach, he saw this gem, this incredible talent. and. Some of the fans uh, in Oregon, they, they thought that Lionel would be a better player if, if he had a different skin color. Mm -hmm. And so it was uneasy, because that was not mine. I grew up in San Diego, and it was different. And Lenny tried so hard to, to make it all work. And it didn't work because of all the injuries that I had. But then when Jack Ramsey came along, and I was uh, healthy for a, a very, relatively healthy for a very brief nanosecond. And I remember Lionel one time, he was coming down on the break and we were playing against the Boston Celtics and they were the reigning champions in the NBA. And Lionel comes down on the break and he's isolated one on one against John Havlicek, one of the legends of all time. And John is retreating on defense and going back. And so John figures, oh, okay, I got him. I'm going to stop right here and take a charge on Lionel, who's just flying up the court with that left hand and the hair. And just, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so Lionel's coming, and he's not knowing what to do when he sees John takes the charge like that. And so Lionel elevates and jumps over the top of John Havlicek and throws it down left-handed right in John, who, who never even moved. And Lionel hits the ground and then just turns up the court and runs along. And John is looking around and saying, what has happened here? Just absolutely incredible. And to see what Lionel did to Chicago and Detroit. And the nicest thing you can say about a, a, a player, a, a fierce warrior, a, a, a fighter, a guy who's out there making a difference all the time is that, is that they're at their best when their best is needed. And Lionel was, he, he was phenomenal in the big games. Bill, when you heard that he was let go as the Grizzlies coach after the year the Grizzlies had last year, and it's happened a couple times now, George Carl mm -hmm. recently with Mark Jackson having good seasons, really good seasons, and having problems with the front office. Well, what comes to mind when something like that happens? That's why people start their own businesses. It's and, business. Right. There's the greatest scene in probably the history of sports and entertainment in Pete Gent's North Dallas 40. Right. The book, the movie, and my brother was on that Dallas Cowboy team. Oh, how about so, that? So I know all those guys. And when they have Matuzak, who's raging against the world, <laughs> and he jacks up the general manager, and he says, every time I call it a business, you call it a game. Every time I call it a, a game, you call it a business. Right. And so the, the no-win situation, but that's the risk you take. And, you know, Lionel is a big boy, and he's going to be fine. He has everything going for him. He has his health, he has his family, he has a beautiful home, and he knows and feels, he believes that tomorrow's going to be better. And so when you have that, anything is possible. You, it's all about health and family. Sure, sure. Everything else is just stuff. That's a great point. Bill, you mentioned uh, earlier talking about Lionel. You talked about some racism. There was obviously racism. I don't know if it ran rampant, but it was certainly all around the time you played. It's still around to a certain degree, certainly not as much. When you hear about the Donald Sterling story, again, how do you... Racism hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day we're all a minority of some kind. And so the empathy needed in life, the respect for others. And racism is evil, it is ignorance, it is sick, and it is weird. And so I, I try to associate myself with positive things. And I don't look back at the mistakes and the failures. Nobody's made more mistakes than me. And I just have to learn to get up and keep moving forward. And so I'm not interested in wallowing around the muck of evil and associating with terrible people. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be with the Lionel Hollinses. I want to be with the Johnny Davises. I want to be with the Jack Ramseys and the Maurice Lucases and the Larry Birds and the Casey Jones and the Red Auerbachs. That's where I choose to, to spend my time. And, 
And you know, we, we fight to make a difference, but we keep moving forward. And the evil, they, they separate themselves and they identify themselves. And the, the sense of just being nice to other people. And why, why are we angry? Why are we hurtful? Why are we trying to tear people down? Mm -hmm. There's nothing more important than the value of positive leadership. And that's the great thing that sports does for us, is it allows all kinds of different people to come and be part of something special and to make a positive difference in the world and moving forward. And, and what basketball has been able to do. And, and, and the sad thing is, is that, you know, what's happened, you know, look at what UCLA as an institution has been able to do in terms of the positive contributions. Forget Chancellor Young and J.D. Morgan and Ducky Drake and John Wooden, who were the four pillars right. for me when I was there at UCLA. But for just think of the history of UCLA with, with Ralph Bunch, who went on to become the Secretary General of the United Nations, or a Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. or a Don Barksdale, or an Arthur Ashe, or a Rafer Johnson, these guys that just, you know, just, just phenomenal human beings. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the foundation of the culture that I grew up in. And then Walt Hazard, and Mike Warren, and Lucius Allen, and Kareem, and all the, and Sidney Wicks, and Marcus Johnson, just legends who, who stood tall for what was true and right. And talk is cheap. Vision, that's true. You know, I don't need anybody telling me how things are. I can see. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about coming to Memphis and, and, and seeing how much good work is being done and the choices that we make in our life to associate ourselves with that positive spirit and force and selflessness and then to be able to, to turn that into a smile on somebody else's face. And think of, the, think of the people who have done and meant so much to me in my life individually who are from Memphis here, Gene Barto, Just a good and kind soul. He was so good and so kind that they hand chose him to replace John Wooden. Right. And, Marcus Stewart, the doctor who worked tirelessly to try to help me with my feet. Lionel, who now makes Memphis his home. And then the great people here at Nuvasive, the spine technology company that has a huge presence here in town that has saved my life. And these people, you know, 12 years ago, Nuvasive was a dream. There was a bunch of guys sitting around saying, you know, we, we can do better than this. And spine surgery 12 years ago was a nightmare. And it's still super, super tough, but it's getting better. And that's all I want. It just seems like no matter, and you had a brilliant career, you've had an unbelievable life, you got four great boys. And I have three grandchildren and, and three two more on the way. three grandchildren. And of course, I know Luke because Luke was in Memphis for a while working yeah. for Josh. But you don't look back and say, well, what could have been? Still one of the greatest players to ever play, but if you were injury free. You don't look at the negatives, Bill. It's all positive, and that's what I love about you. Life is like your jumper. Once that ball leaves your hands, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Don't sit there and ogle it. Don't sit there and bemoan the fact that it's the worst shot ever taken. Chase it down. Life is about what's next. You broadcast games. Right. Obviously, you go, you go and do speeches around the country. What kick do you get out of the broadcasts? Do you still Learn, you really I, enjoy I, it? Learning the stories. Mm -hmm. You know, the games are fun. I love competition. I love the fight, the climb up the mountain, and the hard work and the discipline. But, but to me, the best part is the stories, and the meaning, and the purpose. You know, Jerry Garcia, he, he had so many beautiful songs. And, you know, his, his phenomenal ability through his guitar, through his voice, through his soul, through his spirit, Jerry was able to beautify a sad, hard and cruel world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he grows up, tough times, San Francisco, wind, cold, wet, dark, damp. I mean, I'm from San Diego. It's like <laughs> sunshine, <laughs> bright, and like happiness, and like, yeah, let's go. But, but Jerry writes this song, The Morning Dew, where he, you know, he goes out, 
and and he and he hears the cries of children, and he feels the bitter cold, damp wind and the dew, and it's just oh my gosh, and and he asks the question, he he poses to us, does any of this really matter anyway? And I've learned firsthand that it does. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world because so many people have sacrificed mm. for me to have a chance, right. for me to have right. the life that I do. And you know, there's countless ones, and you, you know, you don't, ha you don't even know. There are so many good people in the world. You know, Neil Young, light a candle, don't curse the darkness. There's something ahead worth looking for. The fork in the road, we're right there. And, you know, these guys who, who s sang their song, wrote their songs to me, for me, and about me. And I'm just enjoying the ride, and I just hope to roll on forever. <laughs> I'm, li I'm like that big river right over here. You're the big money. It's, it's just, you know. A couple of things real quick, Bill, and I know it's been a long day, and we really... Are, are so happy that you spent some time I'm with I'm the lucky one, Greg. How many, you've probably been asked this a million times, guesstimate how many times you've seen the Grateful Dead in concert? Not enough. <laughs> but I started, I'm a deadhead, I, went, I started when I was 15. And when I was 15, a lot of things happened in my life. Mm -hmm. I met John Wooden, I went to my first Grateful Dead show, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were both killed. All right. And all this happened at the same time, in 67, the summer of love. Tumultuous. And my life was never the same. And so I started going to these shows, and it was just perfect. It was just so much fun, and people were happy. And it was optimistic, and it was joyful. And so I, I just kept going. I mean, why would you ever turn your back on that? I mean, I, that, that's what I want to do. And, and so I, over the years, I just kept going and kept going, and then people will say, "Well, Bill, how many shows have you been to?" I don't know. I just go. Just go. And I, you know, and 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 so they were like, "No, Bill, you got to know how many shows you've been to." So I started counting, and since I started counting, the count is now at 845. Oh my gosh! But. I was going for a lot of years before I started counting, so right. it's, the answer is well more than 845. All right, so I'm not going to ask you these last two things. I'm going to end it on this. For any youngster out there. It never ends. It never ends. But a youngster right now who's watching you, Bill, he's, they're watching you. I want you to tell them, what is a hippie? I'm a hippie. And just, you know, I, I'm super lucky. I have been blessed. I had great parents, great coaches, great teachers. I had heroes and role models. And I got to meet all of them, all my heroes and role models, with the exception of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. And what was special for me was that when I met them, I met all these people, Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali, and Bob Dylan and Jerry Garcia and Neil Young and John Fogarty and Crosby, Stills and Nash and, Crosby and uh, Bruce Springsteen mm -hmm. and Carlos Santana and then you know the, the incredible reggae guys Bob Marley and and uh, I can't even think of the guy's name but they were they were better people than I dreamed that they were. And when that happens to you in your life, your life is never the same. And so we keep chasing it down, we keep fighting, we keep going. And you never know, we're at the fork in the road. Mm -hmm. where, where are we going? Who are we? What are we doing? And now that it's my turn and it's my chance, I got duty, obligation, responsibility right, right. to make a difference. The you way said, people did for me. Yeah, you said you were super lucky to, to meet all those people and to know all those people. We're super lucky to have had you. We appreciate you being in Memphis. And thank you so much for spending some time with us here on Sports Files. Thanks, Thank Greg. you, Bill. I appreciate the that. Guy in the world. We'll take a break. Overtime is coming up next.
Last week on Sports Files, we profiled former Redbirds president and general manager Ali Prescott, who last Saturday was part of the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame class of 2014. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Hall of Fame is located at the Bridgestone Arena in Nashville. And one of the new exhibits at the Hall is one dedicated to former Tennessee Lady Vols head coach Pat Summit. The permanent exhibit opened last month and includes photos, videos, and interactive displays dedicated to Summit's Hall of Fame career at UT, a career in which he amassed a record 1,098 wins and eight national titles. And for those of you who have not had the fortune of seeing it, here's a look at what it's all about. Well, the Women's Final Four is in Nashville this year, and, and we're opening the Pat Summit Gallery to honor Pat's legacy and her career, and it, we're, we timed it to coordinate with the Women's Final Four, and the only thing that could have been better had Tennessee been playing in the Final Four, but given what we're doing, it's a tribute to Pat, it's a tribute to her contributions to women's sports as a whole, and not just basketball. She may be the single most influential person in women's sports in our country, and it's, it's a great tribute to her and to what the legacy she's left behind. And one of the things we've tried to do at the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame is take the virtue of sports and find ways to instill that in our young people. We'd have a, a program called the Champion Within Program where we actually make the hall available to school groups and other groups. And we take those sports figures and we take the lessons that they learned only in that great laboratory of competition and we instill, try to, try to give them the basis of instilling that value they could be a champion at whatever they do. The Pat Summit exhibit actually came together in less than six months and and actually the NCAA Final Four committee came to us and said we'd like to work with you to create an exhibit to, to honor Pat Summit particularly with the Final Four being here in Nashville and so with some funds that they had and funds that we had because we had a matching grant that Governor Bredesen had given the hall years ago, we were able to take and use those funds and parlay it to build this exhibit. And then we took a vision and we worked with the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and the Pat Summit Foundation and Pat's family and Tyler to come up with what you see in this great exhibit that you see behind me today. You're going to see the journey from Pat's high school days to her collegian days, her days as an Olympian, her, her years as a coach, her years as a mother, her years as a mentor to young women who graduate from college. There's interactive, there, there's some of it static where you see her trophies and her honors and awards, basketballs from various championships. And then there's an interactive display where you can actually see videos of different aspects of her life, whether it's coaching games, whether it's her thousandth win or eighth hundred wins, different, you know, different milestones in her career, or whether it's when she received her ESPY, or whether it's when she received Sportsman of the Year. So it's, it's a myriad of different things. Some of them are fixed and some of them are iconic trophies and, 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 and things like memorabilia. And then others are interactive where you can touch the pulse of what you want to see of Pat's legacy. Pat Summit hasn't been able to be here yet. She was in Louisiana because Tyler just took the job at Louisiana Tech. I understand that, that Tyler and, and Pat will be here sometime over the weekend, but I don't know exactly. So she has not seen it. And Tyler has been working with us very closely approving what went in here, but until it all comes together, you really don't know what it's gonna look like. And, and so truly this exhibit was finished uh, last Tuesday. So, you know, and a week ago, this room had three pictures on it, and that was about it. So in the last week, it all came together. So other than looking at line drawings and things, that's all I saw. And all of a sudden, it came together this week. Pat's position in Tennessee sports is, is second to none. I mean, when you look, at, you look at the great contributions, whether it's Coach McGugan, whether it's Coach Nalen, whether it's Johnny Majors, whether it's Philip Fulmer, wh wh whomever it is, Pat's legacy, not just because of her basketball coaching, but what she did for women's sports. You have to understand, this whole thing of women's sports developed since 1972. Title IX changed the playing field, and, and, you know, and what happened was it's changed with opportunity, it's changed with what's going on. So Pat, Pat's influence is not just in basketball, but it's in women's sports. 
it's in a it's a whole different realm. All of those great coaches and great players have contributed greatly to their sports and have great great contributed greatly to the heritage of the state. But Pat's changed the whole a whole field of women's athletics. And you know, I don't know that I'm sure women's athletics would still be where it is today, but the reality is I don't know that it would have gotten there as quickly as it had without Pat Summit. A couple of notes before we say goodbye. Congrats to Grant Robbins, who coached the Memphis Tigers men's golf team the past 11 years. He's headed to Kansas State to take over the Wildcats program. Also, big ups to the MUS lacrosse team, which won a fourth straight state title last weekend. Both programs have been featured on previous Sports Files editions. And that'll do it for now. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.